Is Netflix responsible for the NBN's speed woes? And what kind of regulation do we need around artificial intelligence? Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. Welcome to Vertical Hold, behind the tech news, where we talk to Australia's leading technology journalists to get the stories behind the news of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, and I'm joined, as always, by a man sitting on the cutting edge of NBN speeds, Adam Turner. Adam, have you managed to slice anything with the NBN yet? It's pretty hard to slice things with a yo-yo. It's up, it's down, it's on, it's off. I've put in a fault request with my ISP who said, yeah, there's things going on in my area. My entire suburb is crawling with MBN installers digging up pits and stuff. So I'm hoping somewhere they're actually going to fix the problem. It would be nice if they'd actually made sure my suburb was ready for service before they declared it ready for service. That's what I like about you, Adam. You're an optimist. (laughs) We're also joined this week by the AFR's technology editor, Paul Smith. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. This week, we're looking into the still circulating claims that the NBN speed woes are down to the surprise rise of Netflix, as well as what kind of regulations we should strive to get in the emerging world of AI. But first, over to the Vertical Hole Tech News Desk. Adam, what's happening in tech? Mac, Windows and Linux users are at risk of attackers hijacking their webcam after video conferencing service Zoom revealed details of a zero-day vulnerability. The security flaw, which has been patched in the latest Zoom update, allowed any website to forcibly join a user to a Zoom video call as long as their webcam was active. Even worse, Mac users who have previously installed and then uninstalled the Zoom client are still at risk as Zoom's local host web server remains on their machine. While it's possible to remove this web server via the terminal, upgrading to the latest version of Zoom for Mac permanently deletes the web server, and Zoom's new uninstall features are more thorough. Apple has updated its MacBook line and massively simplified the range in the process. Gone is the tiny 12-inch MacBook for a start. Apple doesn't comment on discontinued lines, but we're sure it's gone to live on a farm somewhere nice. That leaves Apple with only two lines of laptops in the MacBook Air and MacBook Pro. Bad news too if you preferred a physical set of function keys rather than Apple's touch bar, because every model of MacBook is now touch bar enabled. Complaints to Australia's telecommunications watchdog have risen 10% in the last three months alone. When it comes to the NBN, Fibre to the Curb recorded the highest number of complaints amongst the different flavours of the multi-technology mix. Although the Australian Communications and Media Authority says that this may be due to the fact that Fibre to the Curb is the newest of the NBN technologies to be rolled out. It also noted that Fibre to the Curb complaints were mostly centred around a handful of internet retailers. The ACCC is taking Samsung to court, alleging that its advertising around its popular Galaxy phones gave consumers the impression that its phones were fully waterproof. Samsung's denying the ACCC's claims, stating that it's working with consumers with affected devices. It's not that the phones don't have a level of water resistance, but that what you can do with a water-resistant phone isn't presented accurately to consumers in Samsung's advertising. So, Alex, you and I have been in this game for a long time. We know that water resistance and waterproof doesn't mean the same thing. But your average punter doesn't know that, especially when the Samsung ad might give them the impression maybe they can do things they can't really do. Well, you could do them. It's just whether or not your phone's going to survive them that's the problem. But, yeah, you're right. So... What it comes down to with any smartphone is that it'll have what's called an IP rating, an ingress protection rating, and that rates its resistance to dust and water getting inside it. And there are specific tests that are done to measure this. Now, it gets complicated because the test is somewhat down to the way the manufacturer does the testing. But broadly speaking, for water, what happens is that phones are tested in fresh lab water only. And that's because it's consistent. You can say, right, Fresh water, absolutely fresh water with no impurities, is fresh water. There's nothing else going on there. The problem, of course, is that if you put out ads that show people sitting in the bottom of swimming pools or taking their phone to the beach or anything like that, well, then you give a completely different impression. And that's where the ACCC stepped in to say, well, hang on, your ads show people doing things that your phones 
well, basically can't do and necessarily survive. So, Paul, do you take your um, smartphone to the beach or in the shower or sit on the bottom of the pool with it? I am. Um, I, I, I t- try and keep my um, phone out of no. um, yeah, p- proximity to my naked body at all kinds because I'm I, currently using a Huawei phone and God knows what people might do with that information if, if it ever got out into public hands. But, um, look, I just think this um, this case here is, is a case of a company pushing its luck a bit too far, um, maybe not thinking through... Um, what the the legal implications might be and you see it in all fields it's not just technology you, i mean how many times have you seen a pizza that looks nothing like the one that you get out the box yeah. when you uh, when you order it's it's one of those things where yeah okay they i think they're fair cop but nothing more serious than that really it's um water resistant versus waterproof they probably won't do it again but they'll probably do something different that um misrepresents their phone in the future and it's just one of those things that the people putting the advertising together don't necessarily care too much about the 100 percent technical correctness of what they're doing and they just want to get sexy people in swimsuits holding the phones and and then uh, deal with the trouble later so alex we've had debate in this country for a long time about whether the nbn in its current form is actually up to the job now we've had people turn around and say you know what it's netflix's fault if it wasn't for netflix everything with the nbn would have been fine Uh, Can we believe that? Well, we can choose to believe it, (laughs) but it's it's not, in my view, substantially true. And and the sad reality there is, NBN Co knows this as well. It's why it's you know it's why it's external pundits who are largely saying this, or stories that are being written around. Some ways, admittedly, that just the NBN technology is not up to scratch. This is not a Netflix story necessarily. It's about how the NBN is not quite as future proof as it's been sold to be. Um, and I know, obviously, last week, uh, the whole Netflix tax story we discussed on the show. And this is this is almost a kind of offspring of that. It's talking about the impact of video streaming on NBN performance generally. And there have been a few kind of strands to it, some of which I'd give a little more credence than others, but an awful lot of which comes to kind of, comes back to that kind of political axe grinding, which, whilst it's kind of interesting pub chat, I'm not as keen on. Uh, I Paul, think we need to touch on that, though. We, we, we can't skirt around it because I think it is relevant. We'll get back to that in a minute. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, all I was going to say, Paul, um, do you think that, I mean, given the history of NBN and what it's said in the past about video access and consumer video needs, do you think there's a lot of credence to the suggestion that, you know, Netflix took everyone by surprise? Oh, not at all. Absolutely not at all. And, um, look, I, I'm not even sure essentially that that's what anyone was intending to say um i think the a lot of this came about by the abc story that was went up online on on monday and then was on on the tv on on monday night um which was obviously they took the angle of uh, the netflix effect because they wanted people to watch the show and as we all know working in the media people in the general public don't always engage with nbn stories as much as you would like um it's been part of the problem for the project from the start is that it's not generally well understood amongst the broader population. And we see the readership figures when you write technical stories about it, no one reads or very small people, you preach to the converted almost. So I think what they were trying to do is is make people in the lounge rooms understand that what you're watching on the TV is struggling because of the MBN and how it's played out um, since I think is that um, people have, who, who understand the arguments about why the NBN is not the world class network that we were first promised are infuriated by the fact that this is dumbing down the debate and also maybe giving NBN and the government a way off the hook to suddenly say that we've been taken by surprise by everyone that's using Netflix because a lot of the people watching will think, shit, yeah, we weren't using Netflix a few years back. So that must be the case. But it's, it, the, the argument on the ABC show earlier in the week um, was specifically about fixed wireless and was more, the, the, had an interesting angle in there, which I think was actually buried a little bit by the way it was packaged up. Um, and that was that the fixed wireless part of the MBN mix has increased um, notably from the original plan under, say, the Labour government. Um, and it's maybe being used in areas now where it shouldn't be because it's quicker and it's cheaper and it means the MBN can hit its rollout targets at the and, and, yeah, and maybe some of the price targets uh, at the expense of quality. 
And so they were focusing on this town, um, Bellingen, I think it was, where people in fairly metropolitan parts of it or, or less rural areas were on the fixed wireless and, and their signals were being blocked by hills in, in the way from the towers to their house. And so they were getting the, the getting inconsistent broadband performance. And that's the worst possible thing you can have when you want to sit there for two hours watching a movie is inconsistent broadband performance. And so that's, I guess, why you could give some credence to the idea of Netflix being a problem. But really, no, the, the advent of streaming services very well understood from way, way, way before Malcolm Turnbull changed the mix of the MBN. And um, it's, it's, it's more a case of trying to make it in terms that the average punter will understand and at the risk of offending any, anyone that worked on the story, slightly dumbing down the bigger issue. It's that problem, I guess, of TV presentation, but you write about the fixed wireless thing, that they expanded that out. And it was always, I suppose, it's one of those side things for the NBN is that those on non-wired connections, so fixed wireless and satellite, we're always going to have a slower service because of the nature of Australian geography. But by expanding that out, especially for fixed wireless, you expanded the problem that was going to hit. No, I, I'm just going to say it's, it's, it's the idea that you could just um, change the, the mix of the MBN. And look, uh, if you listen to the company, that it's, all, it's always a MBN's decision itself about where they deploy certain types of technology. But they are ultimately following a government policy, which was to um, use, you know, the, the quick to, to, to get the, the network rolled out as fastly as they possibly could and to do it for less. And I think the, the, the fact of the matter is we're sort of seeing um, the, the lack of quality play out in certain areas. I mean, I personally, in my house, I'm on fibre to the node and, and I get 50 megabits per second fairly regularly. It drops a little bit in the evening, but it's fa- for, for my current needs, it's fine. But um, I, I, I in no way assume that to be the case t- five, ten years from now. And I think the bigger issue with the MBN is there's no plan whatsoever for what happens after 2020 when the, when the network is rolled out because no one is expecting that the network as it exists in 2020 is going to be suitable. And so it's going to rely on MBN generating enough money to afford the upgrades, which just to me, and I I could be wrong on this. It just looks incredibly unrealistic because I'm told just for the fixed wireless part of it, they need to spend billions and billions of dollars um, that just isn't going to be on offer. I can't see the government piling in more funding. Um, the minister today, when we're recording this, sorry, has been quoted in the City Mall and Held in the Age talking about the fact that they don't want to sell it to Telstra, um, which um, was one way out of this situation. Um there, there might be a bit more nuance to that than, than we currently know, and, and it might not be off the table entirely, but it certainly cuts down the options for future funding of, okay, once we get this rolled out in 2020 and you know, when it's on time and all that kind of stuff and the government's congratulating itself from that and people in certain areas are still going, but it's worse than it was before, what's the next step? And I don't really see any guidance or any clear path other than selling the MBN off as soon as we can um, that's going to solve that and get someone to actually invest in it. And MBN's been forced to scale back their um, fixed wireless ambitions a few times. They were, they were talking about 100 meg plans for a while and they got rid of that. I think are they even talking about getting rid of 50 now and scaling it back? Yeah, I, th- I think it's not guaranteed 50. Isn't it? I, can't, I can't remember the exact terminology. It's, but... it's, it's, it's a product that can theoretically burst above mm. it, but they're no longer saying, hey, it will do this. No. Yeah, so it's very cagey. In and, that but way. they were very, um, very quick to show off when they were. They thought they could do 100 meg per second. They flew people in from all around the country, uh, took them up to Ballarat to show them the towers, show them doing a 100 meg, and how fixed wireless was just as good as all the others. And these people weren't going to miss out. Well, that's that, uh, yeah, not that's so much. the short term politics that has bedeviled the MBN. It's 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 all been about. Um, convincing the people that happen to be listening at that moment that things are on the right track. Um, I remember speaking to someone um, involved in Labour's NBN when Malcolm Turn was in opposition and the phrase that they used was he's incredibly convincing in the moment. So you'd go on to, you'd have an, an interview on on Late Line or a show like that, five minutes when you can talk about the fact that the NBN is going to be good enough, it's what you need. And mainstream broadcast or mainstream media can't go in any greater detail on that because viewers start turning off and the government has been able to um, 
get its policy through without with minimal general displeasure at it until people actually see in their living rooms that it's not working as they thought it was going to work um, mm. and and so, so it's almost it's almost too late now and i don't know about you but when i write any stories like this you always get the the most say more people voted for this um you get what you voted for suck it up and the truth is people didn't vote for this people didn't vote based on nbm policy in the last election it was what it, this idea that every single issue was current was absolutely justified i think it's fair to say that people voted for the coalition in spite of the MBN, not because of their MBN policy. And we, we, we've, we've been left with a situation where too many Australians aren't happy with it. It works well for plenty of people and it seems to be hitting its targets in terms of when it's going to be delivered and that kind of thing. But there's too many people that aren't getting a good enough service for this to be deemed anything other than a failed policy. Now, when we're talking about the media coverage, and I saw you wrote something about this earlier in the week, there's been a lot of criticism lately about the media coverage because the, we'll say the government or the NBN will say something like, oh, it's Netflix's fault. And then stories will be written about that that don't acknowledge that perhaps there are bigger issues at play as well. And the ABC copped a lot of flack. It was as if they just swallowed the fact that, oh, okay, Netflix is to blame and didn't present the full backstory. And even uh, articles this week about the, uh, ACMA test about modem speeds. Um, it, there was a couple of different ways you could spin that story. You could spin that story in such a way that you just wrote about the modem speeds and perhaps gave the impression that maybe the modems are the only thing that's wrong with the NBN. Or you could look at the bigger picture and say, well, yes, the modems are an issue, but they're also an issue because NBN relies on so much copper and that's somebody else's fault. Now, whichever one of those approaches you took, you got accused of bias by the other side, either because you did mention stuff that you they think shouldn't have been in there or because you didn't mention stuff that they think should be in there. So, Paul, do you think it's almost like some people think there should be a boilerplate paragraph in every NBN article that says, by the way, the coalition stuffed it up. And if you don't put that in there, then you are somehow biased. Where do you sort of fall on that argument when you're writing about well, the NBN? I, I fall on the point that if you can't write the same article over and over and over again. I've, I've yes. written articles um, till I'm blue in the face saying that, in my, in my opinion, the Labour policy on the NBN was preferable to the coalition policy on the NBN. Labour was having problems with delivery, and I said at the time, and I still say now, the best approach would have been for the coalition to score its political points by saying, Labour isn't delivering this well, we're going to do it better, rather than um, changing the direction as dramatically as they did. That being said, I don't think every story can be about that. I mean, the, the story that the ABC ran earlier this week about fixed wireless was maybe packaged up in an overly simplistic way. But as part of a broader package of stories, it would have been totally fine to say, look at the problems some people are having with fixed wireless. This is the issue with it. Um, but I think the thing that some people get frustrated with is the NBN doesn't get talked about that often in mainstream media. So when it does, they're wanting a big definitive piece. And that wasn't what this was. And mm. look, yeah, it, it certainly did not. It, it, I watched the, the ABC piece and knowing the whole story, I felt like the the government and the NPR people would be high-fiving themselves watching it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the ABC is being biased or deliberately seeking out that angle. It would, in my opinion, from working in newsrooms, there were stories the week before about the Netflix tax. They looked for NBN angle, and 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 this was probably influenced the way that this was presented. Um, I don't think there's anything um, sinister about um, them seeking to protect people or anything like that. I'm sure there wasn't. It's just protect, presenting a story, but. Um, people who have criticised it are right in saying that it only painted a part of the picture. But then again, you can't paint the whole picture in a 15-minute report. So we're told that AI runs everything from our smartphones to our lights to our airplanes to, well, everything. But the question of how AI should be regulated is one that's often less discussed. And Paul, I know the AFR has been running some pieces on this this week. Yeah, that's right. We've um, we've tried to keep our eye on this. I'm, I'm personally just very fascinated um, by how we're going to manage this transition to greater 
um, use and greater trust in artificial intelligence, um, not just in relation to it making businesses more efficient and everything, which is obviously the selling point for a lot of technology companies, but also how it changes the way we live and, and the jobs that people do and the way we interact with each other. Um, and there's a, a, I guess you'd call it an issues paper that's been put out about Step by Standards Australia that's calling for submissions from academics, from businesses, um, and from startups, companies like that, just saying, okay, tell us what you think we need to do to put regulations in place about things, things like what, what data you can use to create a product to feed AI, say, in a financial services company. How do we build a AI assistant to serve you at a government department? Some of the considerations that maybe the people building it aren't necessarily the right people to make those calls. Um, we've seen technology companies make horrendous calls on numerous areas and these are the people that are often building these systems uh, not the not the people that end up going to be used by them so um, we we early in this week we spoke to the minister for science and technology karen andrews and she was basically trying to she was talking to the afr basic to say please people in business feed back to this inquiry because there's going to be plenty of people that will if we put regulations in place, we'll be jumping up and down saying you're hampering this, you're hampering that. So I think they want people to actually have a conversation um, and, and talk about some of the issues because, I mean, it's one of those areas where you can have a, a conversation and you think, oh, shit, I hadn't thought of that, um, about what if this happens or what if that happens. And we're at that stage with AI where the possibilities are starting to grow by the day and, and we, we, we need to try and plan for unplanned consequences now rather than when we're all stood by a burning wreckage of society and robots are killing us well that's what i was actually going to say is that when people here talk about ai regulations it's easy to think okay they're talking about using it in warfare and trying to make sure we don't inadvertently make um skynet but it's it's not just that is it it's about the ethics of applying ai to everyday situations and how you develop ai like looking at the the, the robo-debt Centrelink thing where machines are making decisions about people owing debt and there's no one involved, could we give, is it okay to give AI the, the ability to decide who gets fined and who doesn't, who goes to prison, who doesn't, who gets out on parole, who doesn't, what kind of control can we grant AI over people's lives? It's sort of a bit more day-to-day than just will we end up being a resistance fighters? The robo that showed that you can't do it if you don't do it badly. But there's, I mean, there's yeah. going to be, there's a treasury in, I think I spoke to treasury in Queensland a while back about um, they're doing it to try and track people that aren't paying debts, business debts, that kind of thing. Um, but there's this huge number of different things that you don't think of. Um, for example, you'd never be allowed or you should, you should never be allowed to make a business decision based on um, a racist decision or a sexist decision or things like that. But AI actually does exactly that because it bases things on data and builds in prejudices that have maybe been caused by um, social disadvantage and will say, okay, we sh- this bank should never give a loan to someone from that area because it's, 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 t- it's disadvantaged and we, we, it's high risk. And, and it will program in those kind of decisions blindly unless humans intervene and say, well, we actually have to have a human consideration when dealing with this rather than just the pure numbers that's programmed in. It's like, um, it's probably cliche to people listening to this, the whole the old trolley car dilemma. You, you hmm. probably talked about it before. Um, if a, if a, tra- if a, a um, tram is running out of control, a human driver will decide whether to change direction and run over the line of old age, old age pensioners to avoid running over one child. But if you program it in a... Uh, autonomous bus someone's going to sit there and write that line that, that says okay you're going to run over the oldie oldies rather than one one child and humans have to make those decisions and think about them ahead of time and i guess that's what where we're at in terms of um business community and politicians really being right at square one with their understanding of it um and ironically um we, we may be further ahead in talking about issues like autonomous weapons um, because of people like Toby Walsh, at the, I think he's un- one of the universities in Sydney, um, is a sort of global scholar on this area. Um, whereas in, in industry about how we're going to use it in banks, how we're going to use it in government departments, people are just buying the software at the minute and thinking, well, let's see what it does, rather than what should we be doing with it. And that's, I guess, part of 
this consultation. So I, I would encourage people to, with more informed views than me, to get on there and, and make some submissions so we don't end up with stupid laws. It also gets more complicated, of course, because there's also the international picture yeah, to go through. Absolutely. The kind of AI that we might think of as abhorrent could run, you know, by, you know, by government diktat in, in certain parts of the world. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, the obvious example is um, the use of facial recognition in China. Um, it would horrify Australians at the moment, but, you know, you could argue, arguably say we're already heading that way. Um, you saw um, people um, going to the Hong Kong protests to not look, try not to use their... Um, the equivalent of the opal cards because I didn't want records of where they were at a certain time to be married up with facial recognition software to say, hey, you were at these protests 10 years down the track. What were you doing in um, Hong Kong those days? So, I mean, it's, it's you, 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 you're right. We can, we can make limits on what software companies are doing uh, in Australia, but then we can't necessarily do anything about what a company in America is doing or a company in China is doing, a company in Russia is doing, a company in Sweden is doing. We just have to hope that, um, you know, or company, countries around the world um, get their act together and, and we don't end up, you know, with some kind of horrible rise of the machines because, you know, it's, it's eminently feasible, isn't it? Well, folks, that's just about it for another fine episode of Vertical Hold. So... What do you think? Are waterproof phones water-resistant phones, or should the terminology be vice versa? Is the NBN going to be saleable, and is Netflix at fault for that? And what kind of regulation should we have around AI? Send us your feedback via Twitter or the Vertical Hold Facebook page. Thanks to Paul for joining us for the show. Thanks. It's been good fun. And thanks again, everyone, for listening. As I keep saying, we're on a big push this year to reach more people, so give us a shout-out on social media. Jump on your podcasting platform of choice, leave us a review and help us spread the good word. Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market.